Well, good evening. Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy. My name is Melissa Moore, and I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy, and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting programs nearly every Thursday evening, either in person or virtual, so please check our website for those topics and those dates. We're able to offer these programs at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Thank you so much, Chris and Mary. While these programs are free to watch, I encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your membership really helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we aren't together in person like tonight on this wonderful virtual platform. So a quick note about tonight's program, if you have any questions for our presenter, please enter those into the Q&A at any time, and we'll get, them, um, we'll get to them after the formal part of the presentation. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker this evening, Dr. Susan Cooksey. Dr. Cooksey began working at the Harn Museum of Art at the University of Florida in 2000, and in 2005, became the museum's first curator of African art, a position she held into her pretty recent retirement in 2020. During her curatorial career, she has made a significant impact on the development of the Harns collection of exhibitions of Af collection and exhibitions of African art, uh, more than doubling it, I believe. So during her uh, tenure there, she oversaw that. She also organized more than 20 exhibitions, and many of those were accompanied by catalogs. Several of these exhibitions, especially the major ones, have traveled to other art museum venues, including Peace, Power, and Prestige, Metal Arts in Africa, which, of course, is the topic of our program tonight, and the exhibition itself is on view at the Figgy through January 8th, 2023. We're so excited to have Dr. Cooksey here to celebrate with us virtually, to, to introduce the exhibition and share a bit about it. But this time, I just want to thank you um, for joining us this evening to our guests, and also thank you, Dr. Cooksey, for joining us. Thank you, Melissa, for that very kind introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here uh, in virtual form this evening. I would have loved to be there in person with you to meet you and really enjoy the exhibition and revel in its beauty because I saw some images of it sent by Vanessa Sage. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, and it is absolutely stunningly beautiful. They did such a wonderful job on the presentation, the colors, the mounts, uh, the spacing. It's just superb. So please uh, have a look at it when, as soon as you can. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here to share and celebrate my fascination with uh, African metal arts. And I would like to thank the curator, Vanessa Sage, who worked so hard on the exhibition installation, the registration, registration staff, whom I haven't met. Thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. Um, I'd also like to thank Melissa, of course, for working with me on this program and for the docent program tomorrow and Andrew Wallace, Director of Collections and Exhibitions, who so enthusiastically embraced the idea of hosting this exhibition. Um, thank you so much. And I know there are many more that had so much to do with uh, promoting the exhibition and um, presenting it there at the Figgy. I'd like to thank the members of the Harn Museum, uh, the staff who helped to realize the exhibition originally in Florida, uh, especially the directors, uh, Leanne Chesterfield, who's currently here at the Harn, and Rebecca Nagy, whom I worked with for so many years and was such a great supporter all along. Uh, and I'm infinitely grateful to Drs. John and Nicole Denton Foss, who were so generous and so kind and lending so many of their exquisite works for the exhibition. Uh, and all of their incredible support in so many ways over the years. I just can't thank them enough. Um, they have infused me with passion and admiration for African metal arts, which I think is made visible in this exhibition. All right, the first image you're looking at is of the artist Jarasegi Sulama, and he's making a wax model of a leopard pendant, 
which is very similar to the one that you see on the right, which is in the exhibition. Now this pendant holds special value to me because it is really my link not to Burkina Faso and to Iowa, believe it or not. I graduated from Iowa uh, in 2005. I worked with Dr. Christopher Roy, who was a superb uh, uh, scholar. He specialized in the arts of Burkina Faso. He encouraged me to go to Southwest Burkina Faso, where Yarasigi is, to study divination arts. And I found out through Yarasigi and spending a lot of time with him and watching him work uh, that he is from a multi-generational family of brass casters. And he left me with a treasure trove of information, which was incorporated into my dissertation and my subsequent research. He was a mentor to me, just as Christopher Roy was. So I really wanted to not only honor Yarasige, honor Chris Roy tonight, but to honor all the metal artists whose names we usually don't know, the things that have been collected and brought here and put in our museums and our private collections, often we don't attach even a workshop or a hand to it at all, much less a name. So I'm just shouting out to all those artists, past and present, uh, that I honor you and I hope to dedicate this talk and all my work on metal work to you. Um, so before we, uh, and I, I do miss being in Iowa and I really desperately wanted to come for many reasons, but as we explore these metal arts, I wanted to talk to you about the different categories of metals in there first. Um, the exhibition features 140 metal works of iron, copper and copper alloys, including bronze and brass. It also includes gold and silver. The works come from West, Central, South and East Africa. In the gallery, groups of each of these metals allows us to focus on the distinctive material, aesthetic and spiritual properties ascribed to each type of metal in relation to its use and meaning. Iron objects, and you see an example on the far left of the figure with the raised arm, which is really a ceremonial knife from the Nkundu or Lia uh, people of the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. And this exhibition includes a number of iron ceremonial weapons, regalia, and sacred objects. Iron smelting and smithing, when first introduced to Africa, transformed agricultural production and warfare and promoted growth of communities and polities. Iron production was probably the most astonishing of all metallurgical processes, transforming ore with fire into a substance that was extraordinarily strong and durable, was considered to be a supernaturally guided process. Um, in many instances, smelting was likened to human procreation. Men controlled iron production and metallurgy in general, and they had strict taboos applied to interaction with women, particularly during the smelting process. The men who mastered iron production attained special status, sometimes elevated to divine kings, but in some societies they were respected but also feared and, and marginalized to some extent. Some of them were itinerants that went from place to place. Today, although smelting has vanished and smithing has changed to accommodate modern needs, the roles of blacksmiths are still important in communities as producers of utilitarian and ritual objects. They are keepers of cultural knowledge. They are mediators with earth spirits and they act as healers, rainmakers, and even undertakers. To this day, they still do. The center image that you see on the left is a copper alloy figurated crown made by a Yoruba artist in Nigeria. And it's worn by the leader of a powerful sacred society called Ogoni or Oshugbo. Uh, which we'll hear more about later. And uh, this society played an important role in governance and peacekeeping. And this crown dates to the 19th century. 
Copper was one of the earliest metals used for all tools and adornments, small tools and adornments, that is. Uh, and it was favored more than gold, but it was also an important metal for ritual use. So it is called the red gold of Africa. It was not admired just for its aesthetics, its brilliant sheen, its lustrous red color, or the pleasing sound made by copper bells. In many cultures, it was thought that these qualities were suggestive of human connections to the spirit supernatural world. And although interpreted differently by each culture, there are commonalities among the, these interpretations. The gleaming surface, for example, was thought to provide a view into a numinous realm of the other world for some people, the home of the spirit beings and deities. The red color was associated with blood and all things blood related, including blood ties, bloodshed in childbirth and in battle. Copper was a symbol for the power of the ancestors who guided human life. And they were called upon to promote health and well being of families and ensuring healthy children, fertility, and establishing the rights of lineages. Copper or copper combined with iron ceremonial weapons proclaim the authority of the owner of such doubly, impo doubly potent regalia as a representative of the ancestors who could reward or punish and even take a life if deemed necessary. The same authority and meaning was extended to copper alloys, brass and bronze. The center right image is a gold disc created by an Ashanti artist for use by a member of the royal court and purification rituals for the king and the state. And it dates to the early 20th century. Africa's abundant gold was legendary in the ancient world and the lure of the gold fields fueled a thriving transcontinental and transnational and intercontinental trade that linked West Africa and East Africa with the markets of Europe and Asia. This commerce led to unprecedented consolidation of wealth and power culminating in the formation of powerful West Acts and South African states in the first and early second millennium. Gold working techniques traversing the desert along trade routes were adapted by local artists who created exquisite gold jewelry for royals and their courtiers in the era of the great West African medieval kingdoms. And by the 17th century, the Ashanti kingdom prospered, having gained control of the gold fields in what is now Ghana. The power, wealth, and spirituality of the Ashanti kingdom was conveyed by gold. Lavish gold regalia, including swords, body adornments, staffs, and fly whisks, were created for the king and his court, as well as for chiefs, a tradition that has continued to the present. Similarly, elites of South African kingdoms had the privilege of using gold for body adornments, sculptures, and architectural embellishment. Gold working centers also grew on the Swahili coast of East Africa up to the Horn of Africa to serve as wealthy merchant class who considered gold to be the most prestigious metal. The far left image is of a silver and gilt pectoral cross made in the 15th century by a smith in Ethiopia. Uh, these pendants were mandated by the emperor who wanted this, his subjects to assert their Christian identity. Silver was rare in Africa, but copious amounts of the metal and silver working techniques were imported from Europe, the Middle East, and across the Indian Ocean. Silver is sometimes known as a uh, pure metal, spiritually pure metal, but it was also known as a prestigious metal. And we'll see uh, many examples or, so, or some examples of that in the next slide or the further down. Within the groups of iron, copper, gold, and silver objects in the exhibition are objects used for a variety of purposes and none are at utilitarian implements, but all of them are uh, designed to instill awe and admiration. Some distinguish and elevate social status, 
and serve as objects of prestige. Others indicate and promote political authority. Others are appropriate for sacred rituals. Metal workers fashioned, uh, metal works fashioned as personal adornments are some of the most dazzling of the objects in the exhibition, as you can imagine. Uh, and whether they are ponderous or delicate, they strategically enhanced the body and invariably drew attention to the wearer's identity, taste, wealth, and social status. These enormous hammered brass anklets that you see on the left with delicately chiseled design signified social status for Igbo women of Nigeria in the late 19th century. Smiths affixed them to the ankles of unmarried women from wealthy families to proclaim their readiness for offers of marriage from a well-to-do suitor. Adorned with the cumbersome disc, she was unable to move and normally or work, proving that her family was affluent enough not to need her labor. Um, most women shed these discs after marriage or childbirth, but some retained them for a time or they substituted them for brass coils wound around the entire leg instead. Although the meanings of the geometric designs are really not uh, recorded, they resemble motifs women painted on their bodies to beautify them for ceremonies called uli designs. Objects used in sacred rituals are among the most complex, innovative, and diverse works presented in this exhibition. Whether placed on altars, carried by a religious practitioner, or worn on the body, they are exquisitely fashioned and intensely powerful works designed to evoke supernatural attention and action. The connection of brass with ancestral power is seen in this cast brass armlet called the Dige Simba, created by a Gan or Lohan artist in Burkina Faso. While appearing as a form of adornment, it was a part of a suite of funerary objects reserved for priests who presided over royal burials. The python motif with its bulbous eyes and gaping mouth is found throughout the region of Ghana, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Mali, where it see, is seen in the context of healing and divination and associated with ancestral spirits and supernatural knowledge. The two beings on the side that actually surmount this, these bands coming up from the head of the serpent are probably uh, represent, representative of lineage ancestors and they may refer to the continuity of the royal family and the priesthood associated with it. The exhibition includes an array of currencies and objects related to trade metal, whether fashioned as open rings, blades, uh, coiled forms or staffs, each had distinctive features influenced by culturally specific forms and meanings, but certainly with artistic innovations that made them valuable beyond their metal content. In West Central Africa, blacksmiths forged blade currencies for general trading or dedicated exchanges. This magnificent iron blade on the left, called a Liganda Doa, was made between the 17th and early 20th century in the form of an enormous spearhead. It is about six feet long and less than a quarter of an inch thick. This is the largest of a suite of currency blades used by the Tapoke and Lokele peoples of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Note that people valued these blades for their iron content and the design. The elegant elongated blade adorned with thin parallel grooves on one side. The blades were an important form of a family's wealth and they could be used in bribe wealth exchanges when up to 60 of them would be given to a bride's family. Since women were important to the household as nurturers and field workers and did many other tasks, iron blades were given as bribe wealth 
were symbolic of a woman's many forms of valuable labor and her contributions to the well being of the family. Ceremonial regalia for chiefs, kings, and court officials in the exhibition include staffs and redesigned or reconceptualized weaponry, such as staffs, swords, axes, and adzes, and one ornate brass covered shield from Ethiopia. The combination of metals uh, ten, uh, lent potency to these objects and projected ideas of military might and political authority, as well as wealth and supernatural support. Elaborate ceremonial swords, such as the one on the right of iron, brass, and wood with gold leaf, are symbols of authority, prestige, and wealth for Khan chiefs, queen mothers, and kings. This sword, called Nathena Tene, has a double lobe globe handle covered with gold leaf, or it was covered with gold leaf, it's mostly missing now, and a thin shaft uh, imaging undulating coiled and uncoiled serpents, uh, which terminates in three blades with cut out shapes. Uh, the serpents and open work patterns of such swords convey messages about royal power. One of the most intriguing aspects of metal arts, whoops, I think I skipped a slide. I'm so sorry. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can go back. One of the most intriguing aspects of metal arts is the way in which varied interpretations of the intrinsic nature of metal are expressed informally and iconographically. And the next discussion of seven works from each metal group is intended to illuminate some of these interpretations. This iron and ivory sword that you see on the left is called a Mbele Aluvende or Sword of Honor. And it was made by a Congo artist sometime in the 17th century. In West Central Africa, the first iron workers were mythologized as civilizers and culture heroes. And they rose to royal status as blacksmith kings. Uh, archaeological evidence and historical records tell us that the Congo Kingdom, which is located in the modern states of Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola principally, was founded in the 13th century. A foreign prince named Lukene, with extraordinary military skills and knowledge of iron technology, advanced with his army equipped with superior iron weapons to conquer the region of West Central Congo and became its absolute ruler, uh, the ruler of the Iron Kingdom of Congo. Congo kingship was not hereditary, but kings were chosen from an elite group who were all blacksmiths. Candidates for the throne had to be tested for their prowess as military and political leaders, as well as their knowledge and respect for their blacksmith ancestry. All are embodied in the sword of honor. It wasn't used for real fighting, but represented the owner's link to the powers of the living as seen in the design of the hilt with an upswept arm nodding to the powers of the an and to the powers of the ancestors and the downward curving arm, uh, which indicates the realm of the deceased. The sword would have been used in ceremonial dances called sangamentos, displaying the owner's agility and knowledge of appropriate sacred gestures and paying homage to royals and to the first blacksmith king, Mukene. Coronation events of Congo kings connected ironworking with military strength, political power, and supernatural forces. The investiture rites included a procession of the new king accompanied by the beating of handheld anvils, mimicking the rhythmic sound of the forge as well as the sounds of the blacksmith's whistle and sacred iron hand gongs. Finally, the new king was given a sacred gilded iron bracelet symbolizing divinity, infinity, might, and fortitude. 
metaphoric of the kingdom's power and reinforcing the identity of the new royal. Employing these sacred iron implements, the candidate was being transformed to become a king, just as iron is transformed in the forge. In much of Africa, blacksmiths are multi-talented artists who have uh, mastered metallurgy and wood carving as seen in the figurated ceremonial axe for a chief. This extraordinary axe on the right features a perforated blade with a protruding tongue-like form from the carved head on the handle. Uh, it seems to combine the styles of the peoples of Democratic Republic of Congo, perhaps Songhe or Luba, who associated leaders with blacksmithing uh, traditions. Artists in both groups create tongue-bladed axes and adzes as emblems of rank uh, that were wielded in public performances and speeches. As a metaphor for the authority of the owner's speech, the message is quite clear. Uh, the chief's words are as strong and sharp as the iron blade. And once again, the authority conveyed by iron is seen and heard unmistakably as emanating from the divine ancestral blacksmith. Originating in Northern Mali, Mandi blacksmith clans work among the Bamana and other peoples in Mali, Niger, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. Mande smiths are called Numu and are highly skilled in the art of iron working. They're believed to be, which is believed to be derived from the supernatural world, uh, that they are accorded both political and spiritual authority to some extent, although they are also feared and sometimes kept at arm's length just for the same reason. Their esoteric knowledge of herbal medicine and the supernatural world empowered them to harness nyama, a universal energy that is inherent in all things, but which they directed in the forging process. Nyama could be infused into iron objects by the smith to make uh, something fight evil, to bring rain, um, but they could also control lightning, enhance fertility, for crops and for women, and to help to ensure the birth of healthy children. While the Smiths made tools, they also created amuletic and sacred works that helped mediate between the human and spirit worlds. And making such iron sculptures beautiful also made them more efficacious as each swing of the hammer imbued the iron form with more yama providing personal and collective protection and serving as insignia of chiefs, iron sculptures are also used to communicate with spirit beings and are strategically placed on ancestors' graves, inside homes during periods of honoring ancestors, on altars and shrines, in sacred groves during initiation ceremonies, and they were carried in funeral processions. In times of war, some were placed at the periphery of the village to ward off enemies. Bamana smiths forge male and female figures, some surmounting staffs that had a variety of roles. Uh, for the most part, they were agents that helped people fight against illness and misfortune caused by malevolent forces. This female figure is endowed with supernatural powers and she is, you can tell because she's represented as a composite being partly human and partly crocodile. Crocodiles were animals that enabled spiritual communication and they were allies of powerful women diviners. Uh, and so she wears the same kind of supernaturally charged hat that, that are worn by hunters and soldiers that protect them. Um, and they resemble the gaping jaws of a crocodile and on the back, you can't see it, but there is a tail light form hanging down uh, her neck and into the back area. You can also tell that her hands are quite large and they represent the web feet of a crocodile. Um, and certainly we can imagine that this figure beauty meant that it was endowed with a lot of yama, the power that the blacksmith knows how to unleash and to harness. And it's possible that this figure would have functioned 
for helping women in childbearing in rights of the Guan Society, which uh, protects women and helps them in their childbearing years. The Okota Obamba and Ndumu peoples of Gabon and the Republic of Congo, and the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo use copper and brass to create ancestral reliquary figures called Mbulu Mbulu. Uh, this example on the screen is a visual tour de force with its sophisticated abstraction and the multivalence of copper that it uses. It conveys complex ideas about human and ancestral spirit relationships. The metal surface was polished to a high sheen to evoke the sparkling surface of a body of water <clears throat> as an allusion to the watery realm of the ancestral spirits. And the sculptures embodied the mystical conduit between the living and the dead and the continuum of life after death. The figure was created with thin metals uh, sheets affixed to a wood substructure with a box or wicker, wicker basket installed below it, which contained relics that were wrapped in copper wire. Uh, it was installed in a shrine on the outskirts of a village intended only by members of the family who were initiated in the reliquary cult called Bwete. The ancestors were called upon to help in times of crisis and to assure success in hunting or commerce or to avert marital infidelity. And they could also strengthen alliances with neighboring communities. At these times, Bwete members displayed the figure in the middle of the village or in a public space and had the relics lined up around it. The gleaming image of the ancestor in the public ceremony and reinforced faith in the powers of the ancestors and the, to, so they could solve the problems of the living and it restored social order and peace. Although the Abamba and their neighbors had created such figures for hundreds of years, by the early 20th century, they were either no longer using them due to European missionization and colonization, or they had destroyed them or abandoned them for other reasons, but their influence lives on. Many were collected by missionaries or other Europeans and brought to Europe. Early 20th century avant-garde artists were spitten by their radical abstract forms. Picasso owned one, and he, it inspired his painting, Nude with Raised Arms of 1907. This exhibition has a number of copper alloy objects created for ritual use for the Yoruba Society I mentioned earlier, known as Agboni or Oshugbo. And Oshugbo is a regional variation of Agboni. Same society, just different name. More than any other works in the exhibition, I think these express the fundamental concepts that the metal arts convey as framed within the exhibition. They express the values and ideas sacred to Agboni Ashugbo that ensures peace, which is bolstered by Mother Earth, the goddess of the earth. And they are prestigious both in showing the mastery of art of brass casting, uh, which in this case, they're using very rare and imported metals, copper and zinc, which are very prestigious as well. So we have all those principles of peace, power and prestige uh, represented and embodied in these Agboni forms. The Yorba institution known as either Agboni or Ashugbo is responsible for mediating between humans and the goddess of the earth called Ile, uh, as it upholds the laws of the goddess who sustains the earth and all its inhabitants. And in doing so, the society ensures peace and harmony throughout the land. At its height, Agboni Ashugbu had extensive political, judicial, and religious power. They were kingmakers, for example, and they also had the authority to depose a king who they found to be uh, inept. Members of this elite society include both men and women, and they ensured the equality and balance in all matters relevant to the society. They are known in the community for their wisdom and sound judgment. 
Upon their induction, they are awarded a badge of office, which is a pair of cast brass figural staffs, as you see here, which are joined by a chain at the top of the head. Uh, and they are worn with the chain around the back of the neck so that the staffs hang down onto the chest. The staffs depict a pair of male and female figures representing the bigendered aspects of Mother Earth. Uh, gender complementarity is key to understanding the roles of Agboni and Ashugbo. Uh, and we see that in the, these figures, they both have beards, um, even though they're male and female figures. But it's important to show that the members of Agboni and Ashugbo that these refer to have to be mature and knowledgeable. Both male and female figures may appear as parental tenderly holding an infant. Female figures are shown breastfeeding, and these gestures point to Mother Earth's capacity to nurture our humankind. Even the metal of the Edon expresses gender complementarity, and with it, the fusion of female and male powers. The Yorba consider brass to be a female metal because of its shining surface that evokes water, beauty, and healing powers provided by the goddess Oshun. The staffs end in a spike of iron, uh, which is a metal asso associated with maleness in the god Ogun, who is responsible for the creation of tools, weaponry, and warfare. But Ogun is also the enforcer of equity and social justice. When Ogboni Ashugbo members are called upon in times of illness, or to announce good news to someone in the community, they will detach the female staff and place it near the person's home to, to help with healing and express goodwill. In the event of wrongdoing by someone in the community, uh, a Nugboni member will detach the male staff as a warning of impending punishment. This dazzling ensemble of gold dipped silver jewelry was commissioned by the Har Museum of Art from Dakar based designer Umu C in 2018. And the techniques and aesthetics of this finely made ensemble, which include a necklace, earrings, ring, and bracelet, and headpiece, can be traced to both modern and ancient sources. And you see it very beautifully modeled by Mariam Masako here in Dakar in 2018. The spherical beads and the headband patterned with granulation and the intricate filigree work and the rest of the ensemble are techniques that were imported from the Middle East and Mediterranean world and elsewhere. And they made it to the Western Sudan, at least by the 14th century, where they took root. And later, affluent Wolof merchants of Senegal embraced such elaborate and ostentatious jewelry as a mark of wealth and prestige. The modern motif of the ensemble featuring woven gold threads forming a basket filled with blooms is called that flower basket and was inspired by a complex popular design championed by French jewelers uh, such as Cartier, who rendered it with various precious metals and gemstones. Flower basket is a prestigious design because of its exquisite and intricate wire work that requires intensive labor of only the most highly skilled goldsmiths. Taste for this lavish gold jewelry is also the legacy of women known as signaries who were distinguished citizens of the coastal area of Senegal in the 17th to the 19th century. They married European merchants and they became highly successful businesswomen in their own right. Their sense of fashion was legendary. They wore the most stylish and costly garments and jewelry. They had their own gold mines and their own enslaved people to mine the gold for their copious jewelry. For the Signares and the women in Senegal today, gold jewels are prestigious markers of their social status, proof of their entrepreneurial expertise and their exquisite taste and sense of fashion. Groups of women pool their resources and collectively purchase these jewels. 
for important events such as weddings. Eventually, the jewels may be melted down and refashioned into a brand new style. Um, and her recent exhibition and publication on contemporary Senegalese women's fashion, Good as Gold, Fashioning Senegalese Women, Amanda Maples asserts that jewelry design in collaboration with the male jeweler, the act of wearing the jewelry and of wealth sharing are all empowering and elevate women's status as much as it enhances their beauty. Trade in gold mined in Southern Africa led to the rise of magnificent kingdoms of Zimbabwe and Makungubwe and later to a diverse and wealthy uh, group of trading centers along the coastal region of East Africa, extending from Mozambique to Somalia. The traders who purvey gold, ivory, and slaves of the Arab world and across the Indian Ocean were routed, uh, were rooted rather, in the cultures of the Mediterranean, East Africa, India, North Africa, and the Arab Peninsula. They became known as the Swahili, which is from the Arabic word meaning coastal dwellers. With the rise of the wealthy Swahili merchant class came a need to display wealth and status through personal adornments. Gold and silver jewels for brides are particularly ostentatious and exquisitely fashioned works that clearly reflect Swahili hybridization of artistic traditions. Coastal elites prefer gold jewels, but they and people further inland both prized exquisite silver work. Techniques used in these objects, including filigree, granulation, and applique, were influenced by the silver work of Yemen, Greece, and Armenia. The source of silver is not African for the most part, but comes from Austria and a coin minted originally in the 18th century called a Marie Theresa Thaler. The taller was widely used in Africa. It was traded widely and used by silversmiths. And it was a favorite of the jewelers because they could depend on its high silver content. Uh, and the taller actually is still in circulation today. This silver pendant necklace that you see in this slide was a port Quran or case that contains paper inscribed with verses from the Quran and it's made for a bride to bless her at the time of her marriage. These jewels were called hersi, meaning protection. And they not only gave the women spiritual protection through the, the verses conveying the word of God, but silver itself was thought to be apotropaic and deflecting the evil eye. Additionally, such valuable jewels gave her and her family financial protection um, because as the holder of these treasures, she could sell them in the event of a family crisis or uh, have them as means of support in case of divorce. Owning these jewels transformed her social and economic status as it identified her as a wealthy married woman who was also the manager of her, her family's resources. So this uh, pendant I forgot to mention dates from uh, the late 18th or 19th century. And it's made of silver and it's a fairly large case, uh, a few inches across. And it has these wonderful bells that have a lovely sound. Uh, and you can imagine movement making them activate it. So it's a, a absolutely a gorgeous uh, sort of bridal jewelry. The final slide shows Ya Owusu Shango Femi and his work. He's not represented in the exhibition, but there's an essay about him in the companion publication. Shango Femi's work speaks to the legacy of African metal artists in our midst. The transformative power and beauty of African metal arts is not confined to Africa, but lives on in the African diaspora. African iron was brought to the Americas as were iron workers during the transatlantic slave trade. The skills of African blacksmiths were highly regarded and Europeans and other peoples who traded with African metal workers appreciated their knowledge of smelting and smithing, particularly their ability to produce a, 
superior grade of steel that could be sharpened to a fine edge. Ironically, African blacksmiths, both in Africa and in America, were charged with making weapons and restraints for the slave trade. In Africa, iron workers were enslaved by their neighbors and by European slave traders, and ironically, were sometimes bound by the manacles they made themselves. In the Americas, African blacksmiths had a degree of freedom and respect other enslaved peoples didn't have. They were in great demand during the American Revolution and the Civil War because of their skill in producing armaments and other iron goods. They were also feared for their power to organize and influence other enslaved persons and provide weapons for uprisings. While smiths were employed to produce utilitarian objects, many master smiths were innovative and known as creatives. Their work is visible in their fantastic architectural ironwork in our city, such as Charleston, New Orleans, and Savannah. Consciously or not, it is clearer now that they introduced African motifs in these works. The most famous American blacksmith of African descent was Philip Simmons. Born in 1912, Simmons was a Gullah of South Carolina whose grandfather was an enslaved African. While he began working iron as a tradesman, his extraordinary technical skill and creativity blossomed and he integrated new figural forms into canonical European designs. Simmons iron work now graces the city of Charleston and is in the collections of the Smithsonian and other museums in the US and elsewhere. Ya Owuso Shango Femi, seen here at his forge in Gainesville, Florida on the left, was an apprentice of Philip Simmons and created this gate as an homage to his mentor. His gate for Philip stands at the entry of an urban garden where it leads to a tiny paradise in what was a blighted corner of our town. Ya Awusu, the Ghanaian portion of the artist's name, was given by an Akan priest and Shango Femi, meaning that he is a favored, that he is favored by Shango, the Yoruba god of iron and lightning, or of thunder and lightning, rather, but was also affiliated with the god of iron, uh, who we mentioned, Ogun. Uh, so he was given the name uh, Shango Femi by Yoruba priest in Oyotunji village in South Carolina. Yaw acknowledges his inspiration from both his Gullah heritage and his immersive experience in Akan and Yorba cultures and their ancient ironworking traditions. A double scroll motif on this gate is common in American ironwork by African descent smiths. It is seen in Simmons' work and on the spire in St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans, for example. Some scholars have suggested the motif on the spire is in fact the Akan symbol called Sankofa. The Sankofa refers to the Akan proverb that essentially says, if you have gotten, if you have forgotten something, go back and find it. That is, refer to history and the knowledge of the elders for answers. Yaw Shango Femi consciously incorporates the Sankofa in his work as well as other Akan motifs, especially from Akan and Yoruba historical traditions, reaffirming his reverence for the practices and ideas of his ancestors and mentors. So I just wanted to point to the gold weight on the far right, which has this double scroll symbol, looks like a heart, which actually is a, a very abstract version of a bird. Imagine a bird looking twisting its head behind its back and putting those two together as this abs kind of elegant abstract form. And then look at the center of the gate with these continued, almost blooming and, and burgeoning uh, foliate patterns that also resemble the Sankofa symbol. And it's so appropriate as an homage to Philip Simmons, his mentor. So I started out with mentors and I'm ending with another mentor and uh, somebody who uh, is uh, working in our community to make it better, to make it more beautiful and to delight us. 
And on that note, uh, I would say that African descent uh, American metal artists were with, they're either embedded or overt manifestations of African metal art traditions surround us and delight us. And I hope that you are also delighted by the works in the exhibition. And I thank you for joining me and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. So thank you. Susan, thank you so much for delighting us this evening, for opening up our eyes to so much, um, so much of your passion and knowledge. And also thank you for you know, realizing this exhibition so we can have it here and offer it to our community. It's been such a privilege and it's only been up for about a week. So we're very excited to have more and more people get to experience this. Thank you, Melissa. I, I appreciate that very much. Do we have any so, questions or comments? I do have one that came through a message. So I'll go ahead and start with that. But as Susan mentioned, please do put your questions or comments into the, the Q&A box or the chat. You're also welcome to private message me if that's easier. Um, this message uh, uh, came from an anonymous viewer who says there seems to be added elements of richness, warmth, and almost intimacy in terms of the way the pieces are displayed in the Figgy's very large gallery. Can you share any thoughts you have on your curatorial choices? Oh, um, I, as you may have noticed, am very partial to very small uh, objects that were amuletic or used in divination healing, personal shrines, because there is a, a sort of compelling intimacy about them. And it's, I, I think in many ways I got a little carried away, but it has to do with my work in Burkina Faso and just a growing appreciation of what I would call these monumental miniatures, these little masterpieces that are so packed with meaning and purpose and uh, they're worn, sometimes worn as pendants on the body so they have a relationship with the wearer and the person who is trying so hard to overcome some hardship in life. Um, but in other cases, we see that there are uh, tools or, 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 you know, adapted tools and weapons that have a lot of wear on the handles and a patina that connect us uh, to whoever used it. Uh, maybe a chief who had this uh, uh, ceremonial regalia, this ax or adze and had it over his shoulder and um, had his hand on it and, and things like that. And you can see these things up close, the little gold weights that are so wonderful. Um, I wanted to have an array of them so you could just see not only how they evolved historically from abstract forms, but to much more complex forms. Oh, the, the horse and rider image, for example, and the tiny, tiny image of a special prestigious chair that it just was so fascinating to me. And of course, uh, there are things that were large and uh, compelling because they seemed so powerful and they had so much metal and they were swords that were twirled in the air by the, the obas or the chiefs uh, in Benin or something like that. Things that were ponderous and heavy. It, I just wanted you to think about feeling the weight of these big collar like open ring necklaces um, or holding these giant currencies up. You know, just imagine the, the weight of the metal, the heft of it, and not only the appearance of it and the iconography of it, but how you would relate to having these things around and what they conveyed. And when I show them on the screen, you don't get a sense of uh, their presence so much but you will in the gallery, <laughs> you definitely will in the gallery. No, I think that's a lovely way to put it, the presence of a piece, not only in that moment where we might be looking at it, um, you know, in, in the exhibition, but thinking about or connecting it to the, the greater context and really thinking about, like you said, pieces like the weight or, or what it would feel like. Um, that, that's very well put, thank you for that. We do have a few more that have come in. So a few more questions. Um, did these metal artists ever embellish with jewels? 
Uh, oh, yes. Um, we don't have examples in the exhibition of jeweled ones, but certainly uh, the Somali and Ethiopian objects. Uh, there's a shield, a, a very wonderful brass covered shield from Ethiopia uh, that if it, uh, a more prestigious version of it may have been covered with precious metals like silver and gold and also with gemstones. Um, ours is certainly beautiful and striking, uh, but it has cut out pieces of brass that are shiny and beautiful. Uh, so it was used for prestige and for show. Uh, we do have uh, crosses from Ethiopia, Christian Orthodox um, crosses. I don't know that many of them were that had gemstones in them. I, I haven't seen one, but I do know that the Somali uh, court Qurans and necklaces for brides sometimes had agate carnelian um, and possibly other stones, but those stones like amber, amber was considered uh, to have supernatural qualities and protective qualities. And, um, so that was a kind of stone, but not a precious stone. The works from Senegal, I don't really know if they ever were embedded with precious stones. We'd have to look at Amanda Maple's work on that. Thank you for that. Another question, after researching and studying, do you have a personal collection of items? Oh, I have a few things uh, from Burkina. I collected, I commissioned Yarsege's family to create an example of each kind of amulet that they used. And I, I have maybe about 50 of those. And I photographed them and published a lot of them already. Um, but there's so many, I don't think I could have gotten a whole collection. And there are things that I have never seen reproduced elsewhere. It's, it's fascinating, the inventiveness of these and the, the cultural differences that are reflected in them that I, I don't think anyone's ever really written much about. So there's still a lot of work to do in, in Burkina and elsewhere on metalwork. I think that's one reason I wanted to do this exhibition was to excite people's interest in metalwork because to me it's a, a sort of, has been sort of an unsung medium, but recently there's this huge interest in it. I mean, the Caravans of Gold exhibition came out uh, recently, Amanda's show, Good as Gold, and of course, Striking Iron, that fabulous show from UCLA. So there has been a lot of interest in metal work lately, which is wonderful and some wonderful research. And I will say um, just from personal experience, our education team has been busy working with the curatorial team to come up with some cool ideas for kids activities around metal working that are doable in a classroom. They've had a lot of fun already. And I know they're, they're looking forward to unleashing some of that and getting responses from the school children. That, um, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I've heard of um, uh, blacksmiths, local blacksmiths being uh, brought in to the museums. The Ackland brought uh, one in, I think, and I think the Harn did too. And we also had Yashanga Femi speaking um, in a video, and that was wonderful. And so anytime you can involve local artists or artists that are connected to African traditions of blacksmithing, that's great. Yeah, uh, that would be really fun too for everyone to see. And the com you know, the work that they put into this blacksmithing is incredible. Yeah. Um, Yaw, by the way, is going to be making um, another gate dedicated to Ray Charles, and it will have musical notes and staffs and things on it. So um, I've, I've been very interested in following the progress of that as well. Oh, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Another question. Can you tell us about the book that accompanies the exhibition? And before you answer, I will mention we have a few copies for sale in the museum store. Oh, the book. Yes, we had a wonderful book with even more art in it than we could put in the exhibition. I think there are over 200 images of objects 
and they are and there are a lot of contextual images so you'll see images of artists at work and people using the metalworks or wearing metalworks uh, and that's really great and it goes by each category of objects in each culture group so you will see uh, things that I've talked about tonight and many, many others, of course, and essays. I think we had about 19 different scholars writing essays for the book. So and it, there's a lot of information in there. The book has gone into reprint, by the way, and I hear there are another um, 700 copies coming out. So that's good news, too, because they're yeah. very hard to get right now. <laughs> But I'm, I'm yeah. so glad that it's it's been reprinted. Now that's excellent news. Then in the meantime, like I said, we do have a few copies for those of you who are watching and interested. You you heard it here first, so I'll let you hurry to the museum store and snap those up. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have one more question, and then I'll end with a few comments that have come in of gratitude. Um, the final question for the evening is. Was metal art produced in certain areas of Africa, or was it produced over a wide area? My father made a number of trips to Africa and brought home many wooden pieces, but I was not aware of the metal art produced in Africa. Oh, it's produced everywhere. Um, it, it goes back millennia in some cases. Copper was the first. And earlier accounts from the 11th, 14th century say the, the continent was awash in beautiful metalwork systems, particularly copper. That was the favored uh, kind of personal adornment uh, early on. And of course, it still is the favorite for many people and gold and silver later and iron came in a bit later. But uh, yeah, iron is produced all over. And the interesting thing about it is that scholars used to think that iron was somehow inspired from um, other places. The technology sort of moved and was diffused down across the continent from say Armenia or East Europe or something. And now they're saying that the types of smelting and smithing techniques are so unique and it's such a mosaic that it's very possible that there was some sharing, but a lot of it was found or discovered and developed locally, which is a very important thing because it's, it draws more attention to the agency of the African artists that produced it. But metalworking is incredibly important. And I didn't really touch on some of the really very famous and very uh, interesting uh, works from Nigeria that are in the news all the time. For example, the Benin bronzes or the earlier uh, uh, works from Nigeria that were just so incredibly beautiful and some of the most incredible works you'll ever see um, in metalwork from Ikpo Ukwu. And they date back to the 8th and 9th century. So metalworking is everywhere, but it's particularly rich um, in terms of uh, copper and copper alloys in Nigeria, Cameroon, and other parts of uh, West Africa, but iron is everywhere. Gold is uh, probably more isolated, although there was a lot of gold in South Africa, as you know, and Ghana and Senegal region. So in Northern uh, Africa, I don't have any examples from North Africa. Unfortunately, I would have liked to have represented North Africa and the whole continent but I can't really say I did. There is a map in the exhibition that shows you where everything is from. So I could have put that on screen, but I didn't, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you for everything that you did here. And there's so much more for us to, um, to look into and, and to visit the exhibition itself. Um, so then uh, if anybody has questions that come in after now, cause I'm gonna cut us off at this point with questions please email them to us. I know many of you on the call are familiar with the staff of the FIGI. If you get them to us, Susan has generously offered to, um, to answer them after the fact. We were chatting before the talk as we did a practice 
just about how sometimes the questions wake you up in the middle of the night a week later and you just you have to know but you feel like you've missed your chance that is not the case here so just reach out if you have any questions that come to you later and we'll make sure to get those to susan we do have a comment from brian lovett i am very thankful i heard your presentation before viewing the exhibition um, so, Brian, we're so glad that you were able to attend tonight, you and Diana. I know we had questions from both of you, and I know that you're probably, knowing the schedule of the figure, you're probably going to be here tomorrow, so hopefully you'll have a chance to, to check out the exhibition then. And then we did have a, a comment from Vanessa Sage, the curator on our end, who helped with this exhibition. Vanessa says, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us tonight and for curating this fantastic exhibition. We're lucky to have it at the Figgy. Oh, thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> thank you for such an excellent job. Can I see um, people on the screen? How do I do that? So um, Susan, unfortunately, because we have the, the setup as a webinar, you're not able to do that. Oh, but I, that's I'm right. happy to send okay. you. Yeah, I'm happy to send you a participant list after um, and just know that they're they're all here. And it, it's been a wonderful presentation. We, we so wish we could have welcomed you back to Iowa. Uh, to see the exhibition and be here in person. But I'll tell you what, this was a, a wonderful presentation and our hearts are full of gratitude. So thank you. Well, it's it's been wonderful to be here and to speak about the metal work. And I do look forward to coming there. And I will one day, I swear, I will come to Iowa. <laughs> if I can't see the exhibition, I'll, I'll at least see the figgy and greet everyone. But I hope to get up there sometime soon. Mm -hmm. No, we hope so too. Um, also, thank you to all of our, our guests tonight on the program. We're so glad you were able to tune in. I know the weather has been pretty nice lately. It's hard to, to sit in front of the screen, especially if you've been working all day. So we are very grateful for you. We hope that you're able to tune in for future programs. And um, we look forward to seeing you, of course, at the museum. So again, Susan, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the exhibition who's able to make it and Susan back in Iowa whenever that time comes. So with that, one more thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me.